Welcome and uh, good afternoon to everyone who's been able to make it. We really um, appreciate your time and uh, spending time with us uh, for this lecture series. Uh, my name is Rohan Kalyan and I'm an assistant professor of international studies here at VCU. Um, international studies is one of four programs housed within the School of World Studies, the other three being anthropology, foreign languages, and religious studies. Um, this semester and next semester, the school is proud to sponsor a number of academic events, including uh, lectures and, and discussions, uh, to share cutting edge research and ideas about the world with our students, as well as our extended VCU community. Um, we have actually another event planned for next month, and I'll let my colleague, Dr. Kai Bosworth, say a few words about that. So Kai, can you uh, enlighten us? Sure, thanks so much, Rohan. Uh, so our, our November talk I'm really excited for will be from Dr. May Miller, who's a geographer, currently a postdoc at uh, Berkeley in California. And May's research examines the role that sailors and dock workers in transnational anti-colonial movements in the early 20th centuries um, organized uh, in order to oppose colonialism and to a certain degree capitalism as well. Uh, so she follows maritime workers through the ports of London, New Orleans, Kingston, the Port of Spain, and New York City in order to understand the everyday geographies of black consciousness, political education, and solidarity in the interwar period. So it's really fascinating work uh, connecting, um, you know, some of the transnational movements that we see today to their uh, longer history. And that talk will be, uh, we're thinking probably November 19th, so towards the end of our semester, uh, but certainly uh, with uh, plenty of time for us to continue to prepare for that. So um, thanks. All right, thanks a lot, Dr. Bosworth. Uh, so May Miller's talk will be next month, and uh, we very much look forward to that. And you know, we're, we're trying to uh, basically have a, um, a lecture series that will you know, be this semester and, and next semester as well. So we're working on events for the future. So just kind of keep an eye out on uh, School, of, uh, School of World Studies events in the future, and we'll, we'll try to reach out to our community to let you know what's coming uh, your way. Um, so I'm pleased to announce uh, and to introduce our invited speaker today, Dr. Nicholas Copeland. Um, he joins us from Virginia Tech uh, in Blacksburg, uh, Virginia, although um, he's actually in Arkansas right now. So, um, but you know, we're all sort of spread out all over the place right now, uh, thanks to this wonderful technology we have. Uh, Dr. Copeland is an as associate professor in the Department of Sociology at Virginia Tech. Um, he was trained as a cultural anthropologist at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, his principal areas of research include Guatemala uh, and Latin America, and in particular issues of governance, indigenous politics, and democracy within that context. Um, Dr. Copeland is the author of two scholarly books. The first book, co-authored with Christine Lebuski in 2013, is entitled The World of Walmart, uh, Discounting the American Dream. And this work uh, demonstrates the usefulness of anthropological concepts by taking a critical look at Walmart and the American dream. In particular, it attributes Walmart's success to the failure of American and global society to make this dream available to everybody. Dr. Copeland's most recent book, published in 2019 with Cornell University Press, is entitled The Democracy Development Machine. Neoliberalism, Radical Pessimism, and Authoritarian Populism in Mayan Guatemala. Um, this cutting edge text sheds new light on rural politics in Guatemala uh, and across neoliberal and post-conflict settings. In historical ethnography, the democracy development machine examines how governmentalized spaces of democracy and development fell short of their supposed aims, enabling and disfiguring an ethnic Mayan resurgence. And I think this talk today will build on some of that work that he did in the past, but also share some of his more recent research as well. So currently, Dr. Copeland's work has focused on water rights in Guatemala, uh, which includes highlighting the central, but also contested and indeterminate role of science in environmental struggles. 
and I'll have more to say about this uh, in our lecture today. So we're very excited to have Dr. Copeland with us. His interdisciplinary international research is, is highly valuable to our community here. And uh, we look forward to, to hearing uh, what he has to say. Let's all welcome him. And you can go ahead, Nicholas. All right, thank you very much. I really appreciate the introduction, uh, Rohan. This is a, a great opportunity to talk about my new work and I've had very few chances to do so, um, actually. And I wanna quickly apologize in advance because it seems that there are some kind of industrial leaf blowers uh, near the place where I'm working. And that's obviously not something I planned. So I hope that that doesn't interfere too much with, uh, with the audio and I apologize for that. Uh, so Guatemala, for those of you who don't know, is a, is a small country, about 17 million people um, south of Mexico. And the population about half of the population, depending on how you count, are indigenous peoples, primarily Mayan people who live in rural areas and practice subsistence agriculture. This is a photo that I took of indigenous Ishil women, Mayan Ishil women selling food at a local market. Uh, Ishil is one of the 22 Mayan languages that are spoken in Guatemala. Mayas and other indigenous peoples, as well as Afro descendants are Guatemala's racial underclass. Their grave inequalities, primarily of land, have, uh, through colonization have led to decades of armed conflict that claim the lives of over 200,000 people, over 90% of them being indigenous peoples. Uh, in the Ishil region, particularly, the army committed over 115 massacres in the early 1980s in a quest to root out revolutionary factions that had um, embedded themselves in those communities. Many of these uh, acts have been determined genocidal and are the focus of ongoing uh, war crimes tribunals. The primary staple crop in Guatemala is maize, which is planted alongside beans and squash. This is a photo I took of a farmer who's showing off his very impressive milpa, which is the name for their uh, subsistence plot. Guatemala also contains unbelievable natural abundance and beauty in waterways uh, with many rivers and underground springs. This is an image of a place called Semuc Champe in Alta Vera Paz, which is more recently a popular tourist destination. This is an image of Lake Atitlan, which is also a popular tourist destination for very obvious reasons. There are three um, extinct volcanoes there that you can see, um, or two extinct and one active in the distance on the shore of this beautiful lake. This is the Rio Pasión um, in the northern Petén region of the country. Absolutely gorgeous. But sadly, over 95% of Guatemala's surface water is contaminated. This is an image of plastic and other garbage deposited on the beach as the Motagua River empties into the Atlantic Ocean near Honduras. The Motagua is Guatemala's longest river and passes near a giant unregulated landfill in Guatemala City. Tens of thousands of people live on the banks of the Motagua. And the government actually recently declined an offer to have the river cleaned by the government of Sweden because I believe, and most people suspect, that they wanted to do their own contract so they can skim cash off of the deal. So water is a matter of grave concern and growing conflict in Guatemala and also around the world. The water crisis has many causes, um, historic inequality, chemical agriculture, weak and corrupt state institutions, state neglect of infrastructure, um, sewage treatment, um, and now of course, global warming and the effect that it's having on rainfall patterns. However, the main cause of water conflict today in Guatemala are the extractive industries. And by extractive industries, I'm referring to mining operations, sugar and African palm monocultures, hydroelectric dams, timber operations, as well as cattle. These industries are the primary source of water conflicts across particularly the indigenous countryside. These industries have expanded massively in recent years. International institutions and governments promote extractive development as the solution to interrelated crises of poverty, energy, food, finance, and also climate change and is the optimal path to create growth, feeding rural populations, growing populations, and to provide clean energy for climate adaptation. However, the, the profits that are generated from these industries usually stay in private hands, very few hands. And despite, in many cases, per creating economic growth, the jobs that are associated with these industries are very few. And in the case of Guatemala, poverty and inequality have actually increased alongside their expansion. In addition, and what will be the focus of the talk today, the ecological impacts of extractive development 
fall primarily on indigenous and rural communities. Extractivism has in fact been the focus of widespread resistance, primarily again from indigenous communities. And this resistance movement is known as the defense of territory. These sprawling enterprises of projects entail the wholesale commodification of the remote and resource rich territories where indigenous peoples live. Communities that have been ravaged by armed conflict confront the unmaking of territorial ecosystems upon which they materially subsist and upon, and, and upon which they sustain distinctive identities and cosmovisions. Water is a central concern with regards to extractive industries. Extractive projects block rivers, lower water tables, discharge contaminants, and mangle watersheds, destabilizing local ecologies, subsistence economies, and threatening human health. In 2016, and this is what the image is above, thousands across Guatemala joined the March for Water, Mother Earth, Territory, and Life to decry the privatization and contamination of water by extractive development. The march, which was convened by a social movement alliance, rejected the free market extractive development model in favor of indigenous alternatives. This is another image of the march, kind of a blurry photo, but nonetheless, uh, what was available when I was looking for them. Water is central to the defense of territory because it is a common link between local resistance movements against all different kinds of extractive industries. These struggles are not reducible to water, but water rights violations are a key factor in each of them. The defense of territory contends that extractive industries are fundamentally incompatible with the human right to water. They also see extractive industries as violating indigenous cosmovisions in which water is sacred, living, and a relative, rather than a generic resource that has no value until it is turned into a commodity. These claims uh, rooted in indigenous cosmovisions um, around nature have surged to the forefront in struggles over water against extractive industries. The ubiquitous slogan, which many of you have probably heard, water is life, unites transnational movements against extractivism under an indigenous frame. These movements propose alternative development models that are more in harmony with nature, indigenous values, subsistence livelihoods, and also a deeper sense of democracy. In what follows, I'm gonna use the term water violence uh, to describe the water-based suffering that is produced systematically by the extractive development model and also that drives a great deal of resistance to extractivism. Although these efforts are not the goal, these effects, excuse me, are not the goal of extractive development, they're also not something that we can really call unanticipated consequences. They are in fact known in advance, calculated and managed. They are done on purpose. And so what I'd like to do uh, for much of what happens next is gonna be review the basis of community concerns with different extractive industries, particularly regarding the effects on water, starting with agrarian monocultures and starting with sugarcane. This is the Tulula sugar mill in Suchitepeques, uh, the south coast of Guatemala. The south coast is planted with sugarcane as far as the eye can see. Um, this region of the country is often called the green desert, but in reality, deserts are far more biodiverse. There are almost no trees in the zone and very few other kinds of plants besides cane itself. The expansion of cane production in the last 15 years due to rising demand for biofuels, supposedly green energy, has caused immense deforestation and other kinds of ecological harm in surrounding communities. Bagasse is a byproduct of making alcohol from sugarcane um, that is used to fertilize the cane fields. Although this is an organic fertilizer, Bagasse smells terrible. It breeds flies and it impacts water quality in ways that are not actually well understood. It, is, it used to be sprayed on crops like through like a sprinkler type system, but local opposition, community opposition, finally forced them to use underground tubes, but the fields are still awash in it. You can see it looks like almost like oil. Cane also requires heavy applications of pesticides and herbicides. The public does not know precisely what is used and in what quantity and how much stays in the water and what effects it has in human health. This also particularly affects cane workers. Kidney disease is the epidemic among cane workers because it enters the bloodstream. These chemicals enter the bloodstream more easily when it's warm, which uh, Workers are not supposed to spray, they're supposed to wear headgear, they're not supposed to spray when it's super hot outside, but these rules are typically ignored. Public health clinics in the communities near cane fields are 
afraid to share the number of cases because of industry intimidation. This photo I took um, in a conversation with a community whose residents live really close to a methane plant, which smells so badly that they, they reported that, that it smells so badly at different times, it can wake you up from your sleep, like a slap in the face, they said. Um, and I noticed that during the interview that these women were carrying towels in their laps. And I asked them why they had them. And they said, look, I, they use them to swat flies that multiply in the cane fields as a result of the bagasse. They told me that if you stop walking, flies, like dozens of flies will land on your back. So they're constantly using these things to swat. They also, in this meeting, the people that were present denounced intimidation tactics used by the sugarcane company um, to deal with local opposition. The water demand for sugarcane is so enormous and unsustainable. This is a, what is called a capture tank and rivers that are that flow downstream or you know that flow um, off of the littoral plain, the planters take advantage of the lack of a national water law to capture these rivers so that they can expand the growing season into the dry season and outside of the monsoon and into the dry season. Downstream communities lose access to water and these dams are these capture tanks lower the water table. Downstream communities no longer have food that depends on irrigation they can't they can't they don't have water to grow their crops and they can't fish. Um, and the rivers are reduced basically down to a trickle. The March for Water, which I mentioned above, denounced this practice and tried to liberate several rivers, many of which were soon recaptured by the industry, which has incredible power within the government. Uh, this is not a very good picture, but if you can see on the left that there's an image of a river that is flowing, and on the right, it's a dried up riverbed. Well, this is the same river. And what this is, associated with the spread of agrarian monocultures by sugarcane and, and African palm because they're using mechanical pumps also to do irrigation. And so this is lowering the water tables to the point of making entire rivers disappear. This is a picture taken in Alta Vera Paz. This was something that happened just last year. So when the rains do come back, they let the rivers go again and they let them flow downstream. Um, but when they run, they run dirty, which means that they're filled with agrochemicals communities are living with the uncertainty of not knowing what's in their water and how it may affect their health, in addition to also strongly suspecting that there's something in it because they can see the chemicals and they can smell them in some cases. But this lack of access to water and the uncertainty regarding what's in it and the great concern about the effects that it's having are forms of water violence. This is a young child who, as parents, I met this family, um, and he has a painful rash. And you can see like he has these little bumps all over and they're really painful and itchy. And they've tried dozens of medications for it. But his parents say that this is because he's um, bathed or played in a river that's contaminated um, from sugarcane fields. Loss of water for recreation is another form of water violence that's experienced by poor communities in addition to these health effects. This is a, a drone photograph of another monocrop of African palm which has expanded greatly since the 1990s. Palm and sugarcane are really good investments because they could be converted into a variety of commodities like food or fuel or fiber. Palm is also linked to deforestation, habitat destruction, displacement of farming communities, workers' rights abuses, as well as contamination and overuse of water. This is another image of the Passion River, that beautiful turquoise band that I showed you earlier on in the presentation. The same one from the earlier was the site of a, of a fish kill caused by the dumping of agrotoxics from an African palm plantation in 2015. Fish died off for miles. This became a national scandal that in part precipitated the water march itself. But these kind of events are recurring, right? They happen every now and then. And of course, this has tremendously negative effects on fishing livelihoods, as well as the health and the, you know, the impacts on ecosystems and regional waterways. Palm farmers, of course, deny these effects, and people live with this uncertainty and the concern, as well as the economic and the health harms. 
The expansion of monocrops has also displaced indigenous communities, subsistence communities. This is a tent village of people that are occupying land to grow maize, basically. The growth of the extractive economy is directly related to displacement and not just displacement internally within the country, but the expansion of extractive industries and the expansion particularly of monocrops is one of the leading causes of migration out of the country into the United States and also to Mexico. This is why food sovereignty, which is a concept many of you may have heard of, which is a movement to democratize the food system, to redistribute land and water resources in order to prioritize the production of food for domestic consumption. This is why food sovereignty is also central to resistance to extractive development alongside indigenous cosmovisions in the defense of territory. Hydroelectric dams. Hydroelectric dams are also widely understood as a source of green and renewable energy, but they are widely opposed by communities where they're constructed because they are implemented without consultation, they deprive downstream communities of water, and they destroy hydric systems. This is a charging station um, of a, I forget the name, I think this might be the Shakbal Dos that is in the, uh, in the Ashil territory. And this is where the charging station where water pressure is converted into energy. This river was also rerouted in order to capture its force into a three or four kilometer tunnel that was blasted underneath a mountain. Notice that there's no power line. If you can see up into the upper right hand corner of your screen, that is a rural village. And although you can see some power lines going in another direction, there are no power lines coming from this charging plant to this community, which is now no longer located next to a river, but a dry riverbed, of course, affecting their access to water, affecting their livelihoods, et cetera. Hydroelectric dams are also built with very little regard for local ecosystems. This is a mountainside that's been destroyed to build the dam also in the Ishiel territory. Look at the silt that has entered the river system due to the, the construction of the dam and the poor work that has been done alongside the riverbanks. And also look at how low, much lower this river is. And I assure you that looking at this river, the part that's not dammed up, it is absolutely breathtakingly beautiful. But now it's been turned into something that barely moves along and has you know, maybe a third of the capacity that it had before. This is a flyer asking for liberty for Abelino Chubkal, who's a Kekchi water defender from Alta Vera Paz. Um, Abelino Chubkal was detained for over 700 days in pretrial detention because he opposed the damming of the Cajabon River. Um, he and many of us, you know, the community there. Um, he was finally released when he went to trial and there was no evidence presented against him. This is a kind of punitive pre-trial detention is a key tactic in criminalizing local opposition movements. Guatemala is one of the most dangerous places in the world to be an environmental activist, such that many communities understand the violence used to impose these unpopular projects as a continuation of the armed conflict. Indeed, the armed conflict, which you know, decimated rural communities, their organizational capacities, um, in addition to rooting out the guerrilla movement, anything, any kind of organization was understood to be guerrilla and therefore you know, terrorism and it was destroyed. But this violence, which was primarily again visited in the civilian community, was a precondition for the imposition of the free market economic model, which was founded in violence and relies on violence for its continued operation. Mining. Mining is the extractive industry that launched the anti-extractive movement in the mid 2000s, most notably inciting a wave of community level consultations starting in 2005. Now there've been over a hundred of them. Communities oppose mining in large measure because of its effects on water systems, not only, but in large measure because of its effects on water. It both contaminates water and strains hydric, resource, uh, hydric systems. Many of Guatemala's volcanic soils contain arsenic, that can leach into the water system when, it is, when rock is ground up to access the ore deposits below. Mine rocks are also soaked into toxic chemical baths in order to separate precious metals, which some in these, in these pools, these chemical pools sometimes leak, and also the process of mining uses a lot of water. This is a photograph that I took of the surface installations of the Escobal mine. The underground installations are over three kilometers of tunnels. The mine is essentially a large well that fills with water and then must be drained in order to access the vein of silver. When this mine is in operation, it uses 280 gallons of water per minute, which obviously has tremendous effects on the regional ecosystem. Like people say that it might be dewatering a watershed and it might be causing um, watersheds around it to collapse onto it. 
springs in communities among, um, uh, we went to, on a tour with people uh, into communities that were located on a mountain above the mine area. And a lot of the springs in those communities had gone dry, suggesting that they indeed had lowered or affected the watershed. Uh, this farmer, um, when we went to accompany him to his land for him to show us the spring, he teared up, realizing that a well that he had been protecting or like a spring that he had been protecting for most of his life was now reduced to nothing but like a little trickle of water. This is an image of a planton or a checkpoint on the highway into the mining zone for the, uh, for the Escobal silver mine. It is maintained on a rotating basis by volunteers from community resistance movements in the five municipalities surrounding the mine. They have stopped the mine's operation since 20, July 2017. And what they do is they stop vehicles that bring materials into the mine. They won't let pipes go in or other kinds of mechanical materials. And this is um, the number of, this is a gasoline truck. You can see it says flammable on the side. And they only, they regulate the number of gasoline trucks that go in, allowing just enough for ordinary business, but not enough for the mine to operate. And this is an image I took there reviewing the papers of this particular uh, gasoline truck right outside that checkpoint. This is a man, uh, this is a photo, it's hard to make out what this is, but you see a little crack on the floor. This is a man sticking a machete into the crack that appeared in the floor of his house, which also ran along the entire mountainside where he was living because the mine's operation below them had caused the mountainside to crack and leading their village, La Cuchilla, to be condemned. Now the people in that village are forced to move and they, they're asking, some of them don't want to leave, but no more, there's no more ability for the government to work or for schools to operate in that region because it's been condemned. And the mine has given them some money to relocate, but not nearly enough for them to relocate and to set up a new life with new land. This is an overlay photo of the Cerro Blanco gold mine that is located in thermal waters near a river on the border of El Salvador, a country that has a ban on mining and has also declared a water emergency. Watersheds traverse nation state boundaries, signaling the, both the possibility and the necessity of transnational alliances to defend water rights. This is a, um, a banner that says no to the Cerro Blanco mine. It's a danger for life in Guatemala and El Salvador because most of the watersheds, most of the river systems that flow through El Salvador actually start in Guatemala. So they're receiving secondhand contamination and overuse of water. In response to a direct request from community organizations around the Escobar mine, I partnered with Dr. Leanne Cromitas, a biological systems engineer at Virginia Tech and her graduate student, now Dr. Uh, Cristina Marcio, to monitor the superficial water systems around the Escobar mine. And this formed, our, our water data formed part of a multidisciplinary study of the mine's impact. Communities simply cannot rely on the state or the industry to test water systems due to the conflicts of interest. State agencies are pro-mining and corrupted by industry. Companies typically produce for themselves favorable environmental impact statements that are often very quickly approved or rubber stamped by the government. An additional form of water violence is just not knowing what's in their water, right? If it's safe for them and the family, is there arsenic in the water? Is it safe to drink? How much arsenic? And where is it coming from? So water data showing arsenic in this area could be a tool for communities to allow them to press legal demands and also to reinforce the legitimacy of their resistance movements, which I assure you are incredibly draining and they're time consuming and they're tiring and they involve years long process and many communities want to get up, but this data can matter to them to help strengthen their resolve. We indeed did find elevated levels of arsenic in several, several of the testing um, sites, although we were not able to determine if they came from the mine. We did determine A, that yes, indeed, there is a lot of arsenic in this water system and that a water treatment plant that had been purchased by the mine for one of the major communities of the town center in the town of San Rafael Las Flores was not functioning as it was supposed to be functioning. So the community, of course, was quite interested in hearing these results. And here they are assembled, not just for these results, but for other, a regular meeting that they were having uh, with other coordinating organizations. Water concerns, all the ones that I've described, are heightened by global warming, which is causing extended drought in many of the drier parts of the country at you know, times during the year, resulting in crop failures that are a main factor leading to migration. Withered corn is a ever-present symbol of ecological problems that are not only on the near horizon, but for many people, especially farming communities in the global south, these, these have already arrived. Oh wait, I hit the wrong arrow. 
This is a map of the water availability per inhabitant um, comparing 2015 levels on the left and 2050 levels on the right or projected 2050 levels. And this is the anticipated changes in El Nino and La Nina rainfall patterns that are expected uh, due to global warming. These changes are expected to create hydric stress ac across the country by 2050. You see the only one region in the dry corridor in the 2015 map is in a, a, acute hydric stress now. And on the other side, you see numerous watersheds that are going to be affected in the coming years. After the monitoring uh, project at the Escobo Mine, I organized a water workshop to train community members and water defenders from all around the country um, how to use field testing equipment for arsenic, E. coli, dissolved oxygen, and, and some other things, um, common contaminants associated with extractive industries. We also um, had classes on basic water science like pH and other things, routes of contamination, and helped uh, the people that were present develop community contamination maps and monitoring strategies. The aim, of course, was to empower community members to monitor their own water systems, to empower them against the industries which, with which they're in conflict. Most of the participants that were in this group lacked a lot of formal education. Um, one of these women, in fact, was not literate. But nevertheless, these are community leaders and they were able to, they, you know, they're very intelligent people and they were able to use the technologies. So this is, uh, you know, part of the workshop we were running and there's Christina Marcio also uh, working with them. So after the water workshop, uh, we had meetings with uh, community organizations, non-governmental organizations, academics, environmentalists, and we formed the Guatemalan Water Network or Red Agua, La Red de Agua de Guatemala. And the aim of Red Agua is to unite communities that are in struggles with different extractive industries and also to promote community water monitoring capacities to strengthen their local movements and also so that they can work together and build solidarity. Um, this person here um, in the gray shirt on the left with the short hair, that is another Abelino, Abelino Cancillo Mejias. He's one of the leading water rights activists on the South Coast and fighting against sugarcane companies. You, the person, the back of the head that you see with the strap across his back is Dr. Um, Alfonso Solorsono, who's a leading activist in the, uh, in the fight against the Escobo mine. To the right here is uh, Shinny Lemus uh, Morales, and she is also a leading activist in the fight against the Escobar mine. Um, there's some, then very back in the back in the turquoise shirt is a professor of science, technology, and society, um, Efrain Bamaka. And this is uh, Juan Carlos Estrada, who is uh, one of the leading organizers and community water monitoring accompaniers for Red Agua, Juan Carlos Estrada, who's an environmentalist for many years in Guatemala. Red Agua aims to build on existing water rights alliances that grew out of the 2016 march and to use the theme of water to build alliances against the extractive development model in favor of grassroots alternatives that are based in indigenous and peasant struggles that are longstanding. We've held three assemblies to activate the network and continue community water monitoring in various locations. We've also drafted proposals for a, a just adaptation to climate change which is similar to the Green New Deal proposals in the United States, but that is adapted to Guatemalan realities. We're also elaborating the concept of water autonomy, which is based in and rooted in community opposition to extractive industries, but that focuses on uh, the right to access water resources, as well as the right to determine how they are distributed, and also you know, to focus on the human right to water. More recently, like in the last few weeks, we've taken a leading role in organizing opposition to a new water law proposal that's been, that came out of the industrial sector. Right now, there's no water law in Guatemala. A lot of people are concerned that that is allowing, and that of course does allow quite a bit of these practices to continue. And industry would like to put up a law that allows them to basically legalize the kinds of privatization and contamination that they're currently doing. And so what a lot of grassroots organizations are fighting against that proposal and promoting alternative water law proposals that are more in line with their values. Look, Earthlings today, we stand at a crossroads. The current path of growth obsessed, extractive development leads inexorably to militarized ecological genocide, where authoritarian regimes abandon billions of the world's poor to slow deaths on parched, raised, and toxic landscapes. This is the tragic end game of settler colonialism. But there's another path 
Um, and this is represented by diverse movements of primarily that's being led by poor people and their ecological struggles, poor people's environmental struggles around the world. And these are movements that are for a more deeply egalitarian, democratic, and ecological civilization, a world in which many worlds fit, to uh, quote the Zapatista saying. The greatest challenge we face today in front of us is how to build broad alliances for a green and more democratic future. And my research, of course, is, de is dedicated to supporting communities that live the violence of capitalist modernity every day and who are also trying out of those experiences and in the interstices and under great um, hardship, trying to build alternative models of coexistence. And so that is my talk and I would uh, appreciate the opportunity to give it and I look forward if you have any questions about, there's a lot of things I wasn't able to talk about. So if you have any questions, please uh, let me know. Thank you very much, uh, Nick. That was, that was a very, very fascinating talk. And um, I'm just going to point out to the, the chat box and the chat feature in uh, Zoom. So for anyone who has a question um, that they'd like to ask uh, to, to Dr. Copeland, just feel free to, to type that into the chat box and then um, I'll sort of read them out loud as, as we go along. Um, but while you know everyone's kind of digesting the material and kind of thinking, uh, maybe I'll just get us started with a few questions that I'll direct at you, um, Dr. Nick. And uh, the first one, I think I'll give you an opportunity to kind of go a little bit backwards okay. um, and, and maybe talk a little bit about your relationship to Guatemala. How did you get, um, how, did, how did Guatemala become an area of research for you? And can you share maybe one or two experiences from early on in your research there that really kind of took your, your work in a particular direction? So uh, thank you for that question. And, you know, I started graduate school in 1998 at the University of Texas, and I actually didn't, had never been to Guatemala before. And, but what was going on in Guatemala at that time was a really exciting time. There had been peace, there had been peace accords in 1996 at the very end of the year, really be, the beginning of 1997 that, that really ended decades of armed conflict and recognized indigenous rights and opened up a lot of political space. And so a lot of, there was a lot of excitement within the country for a new chapter, right? Guatemala had been through decades of armed conflict that had been precipitated by the 1954 overthrow of a democratically elected president, you know, with the help of the CIA. And, you know, we were, you know, this is, this really launched decades of military government in Guatemala and really closed the door on democracy. And so you have you know, decades of political struggle. And in the late 90s, you have this moment where things seem to be changing and you have a, a growing indigenous rights movement, a Mayan, a pan Mayan activist movement. And in my graduate program at the University of Texas, there were people that were participants in the pan Mayan movement. Uh, you know, one of my advisors was, uh, was very deeply invested in the politics of Guatemala and was interested in people that were doing activist research and also people that had a long experience with activism in the country previously. And so, there was a lot of excitement around doing work in Guatemala and I got a lot of encouragement uh, from my colleagues and from my graduate cohort to you know, go there uh, to learn the language and to, I even took a year off of graduate school and did research with, in collaboration with a non-governmental organization uh, on grassroots indigenous women's political participation during the armed conflict and then afterwards uh, during the peace process. Very amazing research, um, I wound up living in rural Weiwei Tenango, which is a, you know, near the, it's the northwest part of the country, just south of the Mexican border, a place that had been uh, devastated by armed conflict, in fact. And so I was under trying to figure out what democracy meant in that context. And one of the big questions, and this is something that I address in my book, is what were the conditions under which, you know, in 2003, so many indigenous people wound up uh, voting for and being the, the main base of political support for a former dictator, Efrain Rios Montt, who was the intellectual author of genocide in those regions. And so many of the people in those communities, they're voting for someone who they recognize themselves to be a mass murderer. And so I wanted to understand, well, first, how did they perceive him? Did they see him as a mass murderer? Did they see him as kind of a savior? And so what was, you know, what, what was it, what did it mean? And, you know, one of the, 
theories I had going into the field was that, you know, maybe the relationship between rural communities and the Guatemalan government had been reorganized and reconstituted through development projects. And I think that that, to some extent, was largely true. But what I found, and it's very difficult to, to see this without doing long-term ethnographic research, how violence really shapes and is part of the atmosphere of politics and how it's invisible, right? Because violence is about, in many cases, things that aren't happening, things that you don't see. And so, but over time, you start to understand how many of the interactions that people have with state agents, with political parties, with their own sense of what is politically possible is shaped profoundly by violence and how, in fact, the violence, the, the long history of state violence and the more selective forms of state violence that are happening in the name of defending democracy really, really still constitute a major limit on the political participation and political agency of indigenous peoples. And I found that democracy, rather than being kind of a, a awakening or an expression of indigenous people's political desire, actually was such a profound form of subverting their desire. In fact, the operation of democracy in rural villages serves as an extension of counterinsurgency processes. It divides them among themselves. Um, it has created conflict over projects. Their communities are divided into like 12 different competing political parties. They're competing for scarce resources, um, which are never enough to go around. And so in the process, they've even come to, in many cases, blame each other that now that they've taken over local politics, they're responsible in, in effect for managing this kind of structural inequality. And so they blame each other for the violence that is you know, built into the political order. And so it's very difficult out of that kind of sterilized, really post counterinsurgency and continued counterinsurgency political landscape for there to be, where can you get a movement out of that? How can collective action emerge? How can people overcome a deep legacy of violence and racism to believe that they have the capacity to challenge the government that has killed them and has shown such a willing and long-term disregard for indigenous life? And so one thing that's, you know, the, the movement against extractive industries has been um, since really the mid 2000s when these industries started to expand more has been a point where a lot of anthropologists have, you know, focused because they're like, wow, this is one of the most powerful and transformative indigenous political mobilization processes for, you know, since the armed conflict, when a lot of communities did indeed uh, join the ranks of guerrillas and organize with them in a variety of ways. So that led, you know, my work since the, the previous book has focused on, you know, I was studying food sovereignty movements. I was studying agroecology, sustainable agriculture is kind of like a more practical viable alternatives for small farmers to produce their own food and how they understood that. And, you know, was it a social movement or, you know, is it just kind of like focusing on local resiliency or, you know, what exactly was going on with it? And it was out of those processes that I got asked uh, hey, do you know anybody who at your university who can test water? And of course, that is something Virginia Tech is really known for because we have, uh, you know, all the stuff at Flint, Michigan, that was Virginia Tech uh, biological systems engineer. And in fact, we're using that same lab from uh, Dr. Mark Edwards's lab, um, not through him, but through uh, other people who use it. But so I, look, the reason I became an anthropologist wasn't so I could, you know, study indigenous cultures and find out about folkways and customs, it was because I believed in the people that were around me and the kind of culture of anthropology that I was part of was about political change and about allying with communities and partnering with them in different ways to expand their own organizational capacities and to think about how to get out of these predicaments, not as like, you know, somebody from the North coming, you know, and being able to have all the answers, but someone with certain kinds of capacities and training to be able to listen to what's going on in communities, to systematize those experiences, to do, to analyze those things as well, and then present those back to communities in ways that might be valuable to them. Call attention to their struggles. And in this particular case, you know, because of my location at Virginia Tech, because I was in the right place at the right time, getting helping community get access to science that they just simply don't have. So those are some background, long kind of history about how I got into doing this particular, uh, but I've been doing research in Guatemala since around 2000. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you like warm weather. I'm just joking. <laughs> I do. I love warm weather. Um, no. <laughs> I'll uh, seek it up. What you said is really fascinating uh, for us here at the, at the school because, you know, we, we really prize interdisciplinary researches and obviously international research. 
And so the, the connections that, you know, with the Flint, Michigan, uh, you know, mm -hmm. testing water in Flint, and then using that same technology, um, you know, to, to, to test out water in Guatemala, but also to link up with um, the democratization movements happening on the ground, or really, you know, it seems as if from your presentation, when we think of the word democracy, that can, it can be kind of a slippery term, right? There, there can be, as you've mentioned, a kind of top-down democracy in which, you know, it becomes a very procedural kind of uh, uh, institution that can, as you pointed out, be used to actually divide uh, mm -hmm. different groups and against each other and polarize them, um, sometimes inhibiting uh, solutions from emerging. But then it seems like the work you're tapping into is kind of like a ground a ground-based, uh, maybe a bottom-up democratization that's happening from communities themselves. Um, so, so it's, it, for that reason, you know, it's a really exciting project. You know, we have a couple of questions in the chat, so maybe I'll just read uh, one of them and then you can respond to that. Is that okay? So this one comes from Melanie Ford Lemus. Uh, Thanks, Dr. Copeland, for the talk. I was really interested in how, through water, you discussed the transformation of other adjacent and important landforms landslides and slopes of hydroelectric uh, dams, underground tunnels, cracks in homes, shapes of rivers. I'm wondering if you can explain or have any examples of how these community members have had to adapt to these unfortunate shifts in terrain and territory. For example, if there's a crack in the form of the home, how do people, uh, do people move elsewhere or do they avoid this area in their home? I'm interested in how, as you said, through water contamination and extractive industries, uh, one can see a whole array of other socio-environmental problems that quite literally on the surface. Yeah, no, um, that's a great question. Uh, thank you very much, Melanie. Uh, so you are, I mean, like this is one weird element of what we're doing with organizing around water. I mean, that could be seen as a way of kind of reducing what's happening down to just this one thing. And organizationally, in terms of building alliances, it's really helpful to focus on that thing because it really does connect. But of course, these things spiral out and each environment, like each mega development project is producing a range of environmental effects and they're not reducible to water. And the effects that they have on water are also not the same. Like the effects of, you know, damming up a river and stopping it from, you know, going downstream. Well, that's one thing that connects sugarcane and African palm with hydroelectric dams, but the other ecological problems are quite different. You know, what happens to those ecosystems? And there's also one, Thing about living near a mine, and I think that this is a, obviously a form of pollution, is that these mines are grinding up rock all day long. And so that noise that's going, it's not, in some cases, it's even going all night. Like these communities are dealing with noise pollution, which is, you know, frankly, it's, it's maddening to have to listen to that kind of thing. The, the communities that are dealing with landslides, um, I don't know a lot of what the effect of like in terms of those specific communities, but what's happening is that the silt is filling up rivers. So it's producing other kinds of environmental effects. It's affecting the water quality. It's slowing down those rivers, um, basically stopping them up in some cases. That one community, um, La Cuchilla, that's above the surface installations of the Escobol mine. And this is a crack that goes through the whole mountainside. I mean, this is potentially if, and of course, you know, Guatemala is an incredibly uh, seismic territory. There's earthquakes, I think almost every day in Guatemala, there's some small tremor. And every now and then there's some pretty big ones, right? And this is a situation that an entire community could be just wiped out. So that is a place, that community got condemned. The mine offered families uh, 40,000 quetzales, which is about like, let's say it's around seven, six, seven thousand $7,000 um, in order to relocate. Well. That's nothing. If you need to buy good farmland, you need, you know, good farmland could be up to like, you know, in some cases, depending, it could be 20 or 30,000 quetzales per cuerda or for, you know, for small area. So these families are being given something kind of like a severance pay from their community, but, but not nearly enough. Um, and those um, of you who aren't very familiar with Guatemala, there's a constant risk of landslides. People are living in conditions. They're living on places that never would have been zoned, um, that, that should not be zoned, right? They shouldn't be living there. They're living there because they're poor. They're living there because that's land that they could afford. But they know in many cases that, you know, they're, they're carving a little place out of a mountainside. Well, that mountainside, when the heavy rain and the monsoon season comes, that could take their house or could bury their house. And this happens every year. 
um, I know many communities were, you know, a lot of indigenous communities because they were driven off of better land that was flatter land in order to create the, you know, the agro export economy in the, the liberal period of the late 1800s, you know, they are going to do subsistence farming on land that's often like, you know, at this level of, of, of incline. And so it's incredibly dangerous, but they're living there, they're making their homes there. And so you have a situation where people are, you know, they're constantly living in this kind of precarious situation. They're living in very informal settings. So, um, and the state capacity through Conrad, which is the natural disaster relief, you know, organization, it doesn't have the capacity, doesn't have the money, doesn't have the resources, doesn't have the personnel to respond to their needs. And ultimately there's a need for, you know, sustainable, affordable housing. And, and I, you know, I, I, I do know that there are really interesting ways that people are living in the most precarious situations imaginable, neighborhoods that go down ravines and things like that. So um, those are really things that I think that, you know, uh, that you do know about. And I think that those are those are really interesting living situations. But in terms of how these alternative, uh, these non-central, but nevertheless really important ecological effects are kind of part of the experience of everyday life of living around extractive industries, trucks driving by all the time, shaking houses and houses cracking. That is one of the most common complaints that communities have. Even though uh, that's not the biggest problem, it's kind of this everyday reminder of what's going on around. So, okay. But there's um, more to that question that I can't answer. <laughs> so, uh, we have another question from uh, Kai from uh, Professor Bosworth. But since I, he, he's right here with us, do you want to uh, maybe just ask your question directly, Kai? Yeah, do I get to talk? Yeah, please. Uh, I have talking privileges. Yeah, so thanks, Nick. This is uh, uh, super fascinating. And I was just thinking about this because in my um, International Studies 101 course later today, uh, we're talking about free trade agreements. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious if a lot of these extractive industries, um, if the sort of upsurge in, in interest in Guatemala is uh, really post uh, CAF. CAFTA, the Central American Free Trade Agreement, which I think was signed in around 2004 or 2005. Um, and I'm also just interested in, in the firms involved. Are they, you know, especially in mining, are they all American or Canadian? Um, are there firms from other parts of the world, uh, from China, or are some of them even um, state-owned or uh, Latin American in, in nature? So, and I'll, I'll encourage, I'll take the, my mic to also encourage my students, especially those of you in uh, in my environmental justice course to ask some questions as well. I know you guys all have something to say here. Yeah, so the, uh, the 2005 date is interesting because that is when Guatemala ultimately ratified CAFTA, the Central American Free Trade Agreement, which really included them. Um, it was, you know, Central American countries, not all of them, uh, and the Dominican Republic and ultimately NAFTA that has affected some industries more than others. And I don't have all those details, but I think it definitely affected um, demand for sugarcane. And I think that that allowed uh, for a lot of sales of sugarcane into the US market. And I think that that was something that was, you know, debated through NAFTA in different ways, but I think that is something that has expanded. And the farmers have said that the local community members have said that that has really expanded. Well, the mining stuff, also, the resistance to the mining operations really take off in 2005. So that date winds up being incredibly important. But the mining, the Guatemala ultimately, at the same time that they're doing a transition to, uh, to you know, multicultural democracy with the peace accords, that was really, at the same time, a transition to a free market economic model, which involves you know, it goes by the name of neoliberalism. It involves opening up the country to foreign trade. It involves um, reorganizing environmental and labor laws and to make the country a more attractive place for foreign investment, um, in addition to other things as well. And so these free trade agreements were really, you know, they wind up specifying certain things and they wind up creating certain kinds of conditions um, that do get exploited by the companies that are involved in them. I would say that sugarcane is primarily Guatemalan capital, right? So these are Guatemalan families who own a lot of land. And so that's primarily local um, capital. 
mining operations are primarily Canadian, um, although there might be some uh, US firms involved in different places. I think that there may, there's one firm, I think it's like Caps and Cassidy that is currently suing one, uh, there's, a, there's a community where the mine has been shut down and it's called La Puya. It's a very conflicted mine site, very near Guatemala City, it's a gold mine. And that was shut down, I believe it was shut down by the constitutional court in relationship to them not doing a, a proper consultation process. And so this, this Caps Cassidy um, Corporation is suing Guatemala for $339 million as a result of a violation of CAFTA, ultimately CAFTA rules. And so it's incredibly abusive, right? They're using this CAFTA rule, which allows them, I mean, these are supranational agreements and there's no room for the government to even you know, manipulate their treaties, right? So that puts an incredible amount of pressure. Now that the license have been extended, now that the mine has been in operation, they basically are, they're very clearly poised to win this litigation in basically trade court or whatever this is. It's not even real court. It's like, yeah, these super national uh, uh, arbitration areas. And I'm not an expert on some of the details of that, but yeah, but Kane has expanded as a result of economic integration, right? Globalization. Uh, mining operations expanded because the Gu government of Guatemala as they were transitioning to neoliberal democracy in the, two, in the mid 2000s, early 2000s, they passed a mining law in 1997. And in order to encourage foreign investment, that law says that only 1% of the royalties or the profits off of a mine need to be given back to Guatemala. So incredibly low, of course, you know, this creates an opportunity, but it wasn't until a few years where these agreements get made and deals get made and the mines start and the real, I think the real conflictive mine, there was one in, uh, there, were, there were different conflicts in different parts of the country and mining has a long history in the country and conflict as well with nickel mining and things like that. But the, the Marlin mine, which was in San Marcos, which was a four by four open air gold mine. And this was, you know, this was also the resistance movement started to this in 2005 and it launched the community consultation movement. But ultimately that mine was incredibly profitable. That was a Canadian firm. Uh, and uh, I forget the name of the firm might've been, was it Glamis Gold? But it was the, the Marlin mine was the name of it. But they, they were able to make an incredible amount of money. And the work that they did in order to remediate the space, they did not, they did not use the proper materials. They didn't use the right kind of mesh on the, on the tailings dam that they left behind because it would have cost them a couple million dollars to do it. And so this is, you know, for them, it's a textbook case of, a, of an incredibly valuable thing, but most of it isn't necessarily through NAFTA per se, it's through other kinds of rules that the Guatemalan government has passed in order to, you know, to spur market integration. But, but obviously, trade, fee trade rules are part of it. Um, so thank you for that question. I'm gonna read this next question, uh, think from Mark Wood, saying that, uh, thank you me for the talk. And they're struck by how many of the conditions that I described characterize, characterize situations in the United States and elsewhere. Can I speak about the extent to which there exists transnational solidarity to support water protectors in Guatemala and elsewhere? Can water is life function as a generative basis to build transnational alliances against transnational capitalist colonial violence? I ask, as it seems that, that such must be developed to contest the destructive violence of capitalism. And to follow up on uh, Dr. Bosworth's question, to what extent is the United States providing arms and other support to impose market violence on the people of Guatemala? Okay, well, there's a lot there. So I think that there is more of a transnational frame. And I think that where most people in the United States have, are more familiar with, if, they, if the first time for them to hear about water is life, they would have heard about it in the resistance movements around Standing Rock, right? Which is ultimately indigenous water defenders. Like that concept, indigenous water defender is something that now exists and kind of, you know, not everybody uses that concept, but the idea of water is life and that extractive development is a threat to life. And water is life means that water is necessary for human life. And also in the indigenous understanding water is alive, right? Water is living and water is sentient and that water is a non-human relative with which human beings have reciprocal obligations. Reciprocal obligations that we, that have broken down. And I think what's happening in this particular moment that we live in today, I think, and especially people of the younger generation, 
we see an economic model that is absolutely out of whack. And we see um, we're on the precipice of a sixth mass extinction event. This is something that we cannot actually contemplate. The grief that would be involved with facing the reality of that is something so extreme that most people, even people who think about it and write about it, it's very difficult to confront how horrible that is. Um, global warming and the effects that this is already having, you know, and the numbers of refugees now well over 100 million refugees in the world today, many of these are environmental and economic refugees that are basically fleeing and displaced by the dominant economic model that is imposed on them. And it is imposed on them through violence, you know, primarily. In places in the global north, there's a lot of hegemony or agreement or consent that this is the only way that we can organize things. When we talk about the health of an economy, we think, well, a healthy economy is one that's growing and expanding. But if you look at economic growth as an indicator, that's a more of an indicator of how much of the actual planet we are chewing up and destroying. How many ecosystems are no longer functioning? How many pollinators will no longer be able to exist because the expansion of you know, toxic pesticides? We are literally destroying the planet in, in the name of a good economy. So our understandings of what is a good economy are in flux right now. And I think that this is precisely the moment where we have, even in the United States, and al although in, under very unevenly, um, and with a lot of opposition from corporations who deny the effects of these things and who also create have many, many different ways to divide communities and to gain a license to operate, like we're at a point, we're really at an inflection point of human history where the idea that, that, that what we think of as a healthy economy has to change. And so, yes, I think that there, these transnational alliances are incredibly important. I know that people in Guatemala pay attention to Standing Rock and I know that the reverse is true. Right? They're borrowing language and they're borrowing concepts. And this ecological, indigenous ecological imaginary is definitely a transnational imaginary. And so that may not be the language that we do for the, the dominant version of an environmental justice movement in the United States, perhaps, but it's certainly an important element of it and a growing element of it because indigenous communities for 500 years and longer have been living the violence of an unsustainable form of development. Now that unsustainable form of development that has you know, led to genocide after genocide and enslavement and all of these things and massive inequality such that five or six people own the wealth of like half of the planet. I mean, it's insane, honestly, it's literally insane. And so we're at this moment where it has, it's declining in its legitimacy. And so now more people who are not indigenous are looking to indigenous people's ways of inhabiting and working with environments that are that have been sustainable and had been sustainable for millennia. So, you know, not to romanticize and completely idealize indigenous peoples, but to say, look, there are other ways for the vast majority of the human career, we have not lived like this and we cannot continue. So do the weapons in Guatemala come from the United States? Uh, to some extent, and a lot of military training has happened over the years. Um, we funded and trained people that were involved in the armed conflict. A lot of declassified um, materials have come out about this and many books have been written describing that relationship and other countries as well. Uh, so yes, are we currently doing it in certain ways? Yes, we still provide different kinds of military assistance to Guatemala and helicopters and different things like that, as well as the United States is the dominant force in the World Bank and the IMF that basically conditions loans to countries in but the exchange of that is that they have to adopt economic models that we tell them they have to adopt. So we are in many ways, yes, it's very impossible to think. And this is something I like, when we talk about immigration, we have this idea that there's the United States is one country with its history and its people and its economy. And then over in Guatemala, that's a different history and a different people. And when they come to the United States, they're illegal because they don't have a right to be, they should stay in their own country. But the idea that there are separate countries with separate histories and separate economies is absolutely not true. It's just not the case. We think about it that way, our models, we talk about it that way in our discourse, but the actual material reality is one of interconnection and you know, relationality. And so I think that is something that we, you know, these relationships, these, even if we don't perceive them, these are real material relationships between human beings, then I think that drawing those out showing those relationships, even when they're invisible and, and drawing out the common interests that people have, working people, ordinary people, indigenous people on both sides of those long chains of connection that we actually have incredibly shared interests. You know, the idea that we are criminalizing 
much of what is the working class in the United States because we brand them illegal. That is one of the most destructive things to the power of working people and to their shared interests in the world today. And I think that that is something questioning our construction of immigrants as people as, oh, they're from some other country, they have their place. Well, look, where's the capital coming from? Like, where's the economic model coming from? Who funded the militaries over the years? What is the historical relationship between these countries, the connections between them? And we see that these fictions of nation states and boundaries, they're politically useful, but ultimately these are things that, that you know, people think they're, they're, they think that their interest you know, may come from hurting other people, but reality is, is that our interests should be the same. We have overwhelmingly shared concerns. You know, especially when we're talking about ecological destruction and the creation of a new economy. So thank you for that question. I really appreciate that. Um, is there a specific tribal law in Guatemala as in the United States, which can come into conflict with federal law that can affect water politics? Not in the same way. Um, you don't have a situation where there were treaties uh, between um, indigenous peoples and the, the colonial, it was a colonization process. And there were no treaties that were written. It was not a, there, that was not something that is discussed in Guatemala. But what you do have now is a treaty that was signed in Guatemala in the 1990s. And it was the International Labor Organization Treaty 169 that recognizes the indigenous right, the right of indigenous peoples to be consulted about the kinds of development that affect the environment. And so that treaty, which is obviously transnational, has opened up the kind of political space for indigenous peoples to say, look, you, you put this you know, project in our territory, you never consulted us. And so indigenous peoples are organizing themselves autonomously in their communities and they're carrying out consultations. And these consultations are remarkable because on average, they show about 98% opposition to mining operations and hydroelectric dams. And this is not just like a few people oppose it or mixed opinions, 98% opposition. And so they're using that treaty as a way. And they're also the peace accords in Guatemala, you know, which is binding and it's you know, national law um, to a large extent, although there's some ambiguity about how much it's connected to the constitution because the constitutional reforms got defeated after the, you know, whatever long story, but uh, there are, they've recognized indigenous rights. They've recognized um, the Supreme Court of Guatemala, or the Constitutional Court of Guatemala has recognized water as sacred, right? And indigenous cosmovisions. What that means in terms of, will they not permit certain kinds of development? I don't think that that's what that means, but I do think that there are, there are some legal bases that communities are turning to for resistance. And beyond kind of the big treaty type laws, there's a lot of illegality happening with these projects. Terrible regulation, uh, bad planning, poorly done environmental impact assessments and environmental harms that are being created that you, know, that you can just denounce, right? So communities are denouncing these, even in the absence of a national water law, there is, uh, there's a lot of space and a lot of legal uh, resources for communities. Of course, law takes a long time, it's uncertain and the laws ultimately favor extractive development, right? So there's some limitations for those kinds of alternatives. But thank you for that question. Thank you, Nick. Um, so uh, while other people maybe are thinking of questions, feel free to post them, post them in the chat box. Um, I'll ask you another question, Nick, and, and maybe this will uh, widen our scope a bit just for, for a few minutes. Um, so just recently in Bolivia, um, there was an election and the movement uh, towards socialism, MAS party, uh, won, re won an election uh, after about a year gap. Um, I wonder if you can uh, maybe talk a little bit about, um, maybe in a more specific sense, uh, what connections there could be from the Bolivian case where you know you have a, a an, an indigenous majority within a country yeah. that is able to seize state power through through a democratic process, um, and then you know can nationalize certain industries, yeah. do, and 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 do similar things such as you know declare you know give uh, rights to Mother Nature. Uh, and, and, right. and draw on, on certain uh, indigenous cosmologies in order to rewrite politics in a number of ways. Um, how, how applicable is that approach to the Guatemalan case? I mean, I know there's a lot of differences in terms of culture and language between those two places. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they're both legacies of, of Spanish colonization in the yeah. Americas. So there's that link. 
So if you can just speak to that. So uh, interesting comparison between Bolivia, very interesting to discuss lots of similarities and lots of differences as well. But in the 1950s, when the United States saw the revolution happening, the democratic revolution in Guatemala that was implementing land reform, you know, that was nationalizing land that belonged to the United Fruit Company, which is the largest landowner in the country, giving it to small farmers in order to empower them economically. Well, the United States, this was the beginning of the Cold War. And we were like, no, that's communism. This is going to create workers' unions. And, you know, we don't want this. And that was five years prior to the Cuban Revolution. So there had not been a specter so much of communism in this hemisphere. Um, but ultimately, so we overthrow the government. And in Bolivia, there were also revolutionary movements around that time. And of course, these are countries that are both very poor, but resource rich. You know, Bolivia had the largest silver deposits in world history, right? Extracting that and taking all of the resources, all the silver was a big part of bankrolling the Industrial Revolution in Europe, right? Talk about connecting histories. And so when the United States overthrew the government, whereas they overthrew the government in Guatemala and instituted decades of violent, horrific military dictatorship, in Bolivia, the United States allowed a kind of revolution to happen. And so they expanded labor rights and they expanded, they did some land reform. And I'm not you know, a complete expert on Bolivian history, but they were able to create a lot more democratic reform and had unions and different things like that. So one of the major differences between what has happened and what was possible in Bolivia through democracy in the mid 2000s, the key difference is that Guatemala had just undergone a horrific civil war, like one of the worst in the entire hemisphere. So, you know, like I said, 200,000 dead, you know, 60, 70,000 people disappeared without a trace. You have, you know, the militarization of society. All of these rural communities were forced to participate in paramilitary organizations. I mean, this really penetrated the fear of state violence into everyday life for so many different communities. And that history of extreme state violence is, is the major difference when, you know, with the transition to democracy of Guatemala in the early 80s, the mid 80s, it was still under military occupation in all these rural communities. So what democracy was allowed to be and how it was constructed and how it was really finely tuned to extend the effects of counterinsurgency, well, those things had not happened in Bolivia. And so what's happened in Bolivia with Morales, you have um, one of the major points of opposition to uh, one of the major reasons for the uprisings in Bolivia that started five years before Morales was precisely these kinds of policies, these neoliberal policies that were being imposed on Bolivia by the IMF and the World Bank. And the first one was the privatization of water. And so I've been thinking a lot about the Bolivian case lately because they, you know, a subsidiary of Bechtel, this transnational corporation, US-based, basically got the water rights to all of Bolivian water, made it illegal for community uh, there were like water regulating boards that existed in different communities that existed for many, many years. They operated you know, on communal principles and water access. They made that illegal. And they also, they started charging people for the use of water. Um, and they also made it illegal to save rainwater, right? To collect it because that was considered part of the, what the private corporation was gonna do. And of course, privatization is always sold as a way, you know, hey, this is gonna make things more efficient. It'll be a great way for the government to have resources so that it can, you know, do different kinds of development and programs. Um, but ultimately the price of water went up and that set off what was the water war in Bolivia. And that set off a process of political organization that ultimately led to that law being vacated, not too, not too much longer after. And it also created a process of political organizing and transformation that, that led, because a few years later they privatized gas and the price of gas goes up. And Bolivia is a country that has huge deposits of natural gas and hydrocarbon reserves. Those have been um, basically, it was, you know, they have been licensed out to transnational corporations, I believe also US corporations that were, you know, paid a certain amount of royalties to the state of Bolivia in order to take that and sell those, you know, internationally, you know, to other countries and different things. And so there was another war. There was a water war in 2000. Then in 2003, you have the gas wars. And ultimately, that plus you know, widespread opposition to these illegitimate governments that were doing that kind of privatization work for the, you know, the World Bank and the IMF, and also uh, op grassroots opposition to coca eradication policies from the United States and the DEA. Evo Morales, his career was he was a coca grower union organizer. 
right? He was a president of the Kokogoro Union. And so different factions of Bolivian society, including 10 miner workers, 10 mines being a very important part of the economy, and a very, they had like a really powerful um, organizational knowledge in how to do things. And so their movement at different parts of the country really showed people how to do a really effective kind of, you know, militant labor organizing. So these things come together and they ultimately, they were able to get rid of a couple of presidents, right? Prior to the election of Evo Morales, they just kicked them out of office. And then they create the MAS as the movement to socialism as a political instrument of all of these, you know, indigenous and peasant communities and workers, organizations and, you know, unionists and coca growers. So it became this, you know, massive alliance. And it was a massive alliance in opposition to the kind of neoliberal free market policies that have been imposed in the country. So they get elected and it's interesting what happens because they get elected. Evo Morales is the first indigenous president of Bolivia. It's a big deal. The entire election is framed as a form of indigenous populism, right? That we are going to live and govern according to indigenous values. One of the first things that they did was they had a constitutional assembly to basically rewrite the constitution to enable the democratic will of these kind of constituencies, most of whom had been, you know, they weren't citizens or considered citizens in any meaningful way at the time that the actual constitution or the then constitution of Bolivia was implemented, right? It was, you know, it was implemented by people that were descendants of colonists that wanted to run the country according to their own, uh, their own ways. And so this constitution didn't really fit, didn't really allow the political demands of the democratic majority to work. And so they had a new constitutional assembly and they rewrote the constitution of Bolivia. And a key element of that was to incorporate indigenous values. However, the government of Bolivia on the one hand was committed to indigenous values and they proclaimed in the year 2010, Evo Morales is leading the charge about climate change globally. And you know what it would take, and he was talking about ecological genocide. He was talking about the death that wealthy countries have because we are the ones who've used up all the carbon and we're the ones who've you know, created this economy that they were trying to get you know, first world countries to develop and to do ecological transitions. Well, that obviously didn't happen. And then the thinking within the Moss administration changed like, look, you know, we're not, we're a poor country. One of our resources is natural gas. And so one of the first things that they did was renegotiate the contracts. They called it nationalizing and it was kind of like that, but they basically renegotiated the contracts with foreign corporations regarding natural gas, got a way better percentage of return on the profits and they used those profits to fund anti-poverty programs. They cut poverty by like, they cut extreme poverty by like 30, 40%. They cut poverty like 50%. These are massive gains that nobody talks about in the United States. And this was primarily funded by natural gas sales, right? And it was a renegotiated contract. Now, okay, so natural gas sales, how consistent is that with the idea that the Pachamama or Mother Earth is recognized in the constitution of Bolivia? Well, uh, the way that Evan Rouse talked about that in some cases was like, hey, look, the Mother Earth is wants to take care of us. And so she's giving us this natural gas that we have that we can then sell to use and fund for social programs. And so there was a really complicated and one uh, really influential, really good book about uh, about if the ten years of it, the first ten years of the, of the of the revolution there, the democratic revolution, is called the indigenous state, and it's precisely about how these ideas of development and decolonization that they were linked together earlier on, and then they kind of separated out. There's different understandings of development and different understandings of decolonization, and decolonization ultimately came to mean extracting resources to use for, to get people out of poverty. And so a lot of critics internal, and one of the reasons why the Morales regime was, uh, the, the Morales coalition was divided up until last year, in part because he was still the leader and hadn't um, appointed another person to take his place. So he had the perception of being a caudillo or a strong man, um, but also because they had pursued a development strategy that was based on resource extraction that affected indigenous communities. And now so other communities benefited. And even those communities that were affected were benefiting from anti-poverty programs. But they were saying, look, we, these are our territories. And one particular point of conflict was the, the creation of a natural gas pipeline 
the Tipnis, right, through like ecological reserve. And it was, and also the expansion of the soy frontier. So the expansion of, again, agrarian monocrops, deforesting, having horrible effects on water, um, horrible, you know, pesticides, all these things that, that were part of a new development model that was based on redistribution, right? So the difference, of course, between Guatemala and uh, Bolivia is that huge history of violence made, you know, uh, kind of more of a democratic uprising in Guatemala less possible. And the next is that in Bolivia, the extractivism had, has always been done and it's always been dominated by, you know, non-indigenous people and by the wealthy and transnational elites. Now there's a way in which, you know, poor communities are saying, look, it's our turn. We're poor. The primary demand and desire for extractivism has to be to meet our needs. And we need to do extractivism to do that. And so we're a poor country. We're not responsible for global warming. You know, we're, we have to take care of poverty within our country. And so there's been a way of reading extractive development as uh, they call it progressive extractivism, some theorists, um, although the, you know, they oppose it, but they say this is the model that's being used. And I think that you know, poor countries like in Bolivia are not primarily the ones responsible for global warming for sure, but what they do with the rest of the land and how that land gets used and whether or not it's soy or whether or not it's, you know, other kinds of monocrops, those are things that obviously do affect, you know, people there in a more, you know, more direct way. And I think these are the debates going forward, right? Is it possible? So what happened is, is a lot of people who had defected from the Morales Alliance because they were concerned about extractive development, then saw that the alternative was basically an anti-democratic white supremacist, you know, theocratic, uh, fascist, you know, U.S. aligned group that was giving away their natural resources again to the United States. And so that was, once that government de facto ruled for about a year and used violence as well, people got sick of that and now have put back into morales. But the divisions there between what is going to be the development model, are we going to have, you know, extractive development or, or not? And who benefits and how can we make up for the effects of extractivism, that is still gonna be the major political division going forward. Thanks, Nick. Um, yeah, and that's, that's definitely an unfolding situation. So we have to keep an eye on that. Um, I, don't, I don't see any uh, new questions uh, in the chat. So why don't, I, why don't I give you a final question and we'll kind of okay. end on this. Um, so in your book, uh, you have kind of three you know, subheadings, right? Neoliberalism, you've talked about, um, you've talked a little bit about authoritarian populism, um, mm -hmm. but there's a very curious term right in the middle of that called radical pessimism. And I thought maybe this would be a good way to maybe kind of close this discussion um, or not close it, but just kind of end it. Yeah. Um, what do you mean by radical pessimism? What is, uh, what is radical about being pessimistic and how do you in general look at your research in relationship to the future? No, thank you for that uh, question. So there, I don't think that there's necessarily anything radical about being pessimistic. I'm saying it's the conjunction, what I'm seeing in Guatemala is the conjunction between a radical worldview and an idea that, you know, and, these, and this is from the perspective of, you know, people living in rural indigenous communities. And how do they understand the state? What do they understand the relationship between the state and corporations? I mean, in their perception, and this is widely shared, they see the state as a monster that operates in a cruel way that is willing to take their lives and destroy them. And they, are, they think that policies like land reform are great. Like most rural communities, even with some caveats and different things and hemming and hawing, and there've been decades and decades of efforts to demonize those kinds of redistributive policies as communism, as bad, as horrible, but nevertheless, even despite all of this horrific counterinsurgency, one of the most intensive counterinsurgencies in the hemisphere, these communities still understand themselves as opposed to the state, as in favor of major redistributive reforms, things that would be called the United States Socialist. And now, of course, when they're in more of conflicts with extractive industries, there is this I, there is even more engagement with kind of a radical ecological politics and these indigenous worldviews and environmental perceptions and consciousness, things that have kind of always existed are coming to the fore in new and powerful ways. 
okay, so there's a radicalness to, you know, grassroots political imaginaries, but there's a pessimism. There's this deep seated sense. And this is a direct effect of political violence for decades that you can't change anything and that we can't change anything. And so I think that what we wind up having, you know, and it's not something that's only Guatemala and Guatemala is definitely shaped by this long history of violence, but you still have the kind of remnants of this radical political culture that led in many cases for a lot of rural communities to join a revolutionary movement, you know, in the late 1970s. And they supported a, you know, nationalist policies in the 1940s and 50s. And, you know, they've constantly tried to work for these changes but what you see is a lot of people have given up and they don't think that change is possible. And as soon as you, they mentioned, like if you, what I would ask people, I was interviewed, I was like, what do you think about land reform? What do you think about these things? They're like, oh, it's really great. You cannot do it. It is impossible. It is totally impossible. You have to forget about it. I work with NGOs now a lot and I'll say, well, you know, maybe it would be good to position land reform as part of this discussion about food sovereignty. And they'll be like, no, 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 we can't do that. Land reform has been completely demonized or satanized or whatever. You can't use the concept, it's been ruined, even though they think that it's absolutely necessary. Guatemalan land concentration is completely abysmal. It's like the major cause of migration out of the country. It's, we need to take land from major agribusiness, redistribute it, it would end poverty, not completely, but almost completely would end poverty in the country. And it would create the basis for an ecological transition to different kinds of ecological agriculture, agroecology. I mean, you could really end hunger and malnutrition in the country with a, with a sustained you know, uh, redistribution of land, but people don't want to bring it up. It's too demonized. And so that combination of radical desire and radical understanding of how, I mean, look, they think that the world is run by the state and corporations that are trying to kill them. And it's so powerful, right, that that sense of, you know, we want these changes, but we can't get them, that even rationalizes supporting the most horrific politicians because they're like, look, they're all bad. I'm going to get something here locally, but like I fought and fought for something else and we can't do it. So now, yes, I know that guy's a mass murderer, but I know these other parties are just as bad. And that person offered me a position in the party. I'm going to get a salary for the first time. You know, it's heartbreaking to see these stories. But it's also, I think, you know, it's important on the one hand to, to point it out ethnographically, you know, to say, hey, look, there's a lot of people who, if, it, if they could decide about what world they wanted in kind of a more democratic way, they would have far reaching, they would have, you know, healthcare and they would have all sorts of things, rural development programs that really help them. But they cannot even imagine that it would be possible, that that world is, that possibility has been completely foreclosed by political violence. Whereas in the United States, I think that there's less of a radical, I think there's a spontaneous consent to capitalism for most people and a very competitive capitalism. Even when you have a situation of, you know, mega billionaires like we have today, people still think that this is the ideal way to organize an economy. So that's not very radical. But what you do start to see are more, you know, I think that you're starting to see a lack of consent, a withdrawal of consent from this political system as a result of uh, inequality, as a result of the fact that so many political demands that are really popular cannot get passed in this political system, as a result of, uh, and also the result in the United States of Donald Trump being elected. I think that has really decreased the legitimacy of the political system for a lot of people and for ecological problems that are happening that I've already mentioned that like people are seeing that this is no longer possible. And so what happens next is really interesting because you have a, what you have in the United States is the imposition of a political system where you have, you basically have a party trying to kind of legally institute minority rule permanently, right? And that is, it kind of looks like they, they aren't gonna be able to pass too much legislation, but they can crush any kind of legislation that through the court system, through packing courts and, you know, capturing those courts, even though the people that they're putting into place are wildly, wildly out of step of the way that most people think, right? Even in a, you know, fairly middle of the road, not radical country. Um, so what you're seeing now is a growing radicalism because of the disjuncture and the failure of the ecological situation, the economy, the political system. Of course, these crises are all related in COVID, obviously, which is a direct cause of extractive development globally. 
um, or directly caused by extractive development. It's part of the kind of global food system that we have, and there'll be other ones, and there already other have been other you know diseases that have broken out. So you have these kinds of growing discontent and a growing delegitimacy, and you see the rise of interest in things like socialism, green socialism, uh, that are really democratically popular demands. And so what happens in a moment where you have a political system that is like, no, absolutely not. You're going to stay in debt. There's going to be the, the future ecology is going to be a wasteland. You don't have any material rights. And you don't even have the right to vote, basically. And let, you know, you don't get the right to pick your political system. And so I think that what you're going to have in that is that is not really sustainable. And so it's very difficult for people to consent to a political system that basically says you don't have a future and that consigns them to poverty. I mean, it makes it very, very difficult. And those are conditions for mass movements. And mass movements are the most powerful force in human history, human solidarity. And that is how things change. Not any individuals, you know, ideas matter, technologies matter, but ultimately it's organizing. It's humans coming together in solidarity and fighting for change. And those movements could wash away all of the things around us. We have a huge possibility, and I like to tell people this all the time, that we can solve the problems that we face. Not all of them, right? We're going to be dealing with ecological fallout for generations, but we don't have to have it just fall on the poorest people. We don't have to have billions of people in complete abject poverty and hunger. We can do this in a better way. We can solve these problems. We can reverse global warming. We can fix dirty environments. We can clean them up, right? We can reorganize society according to human needs and building mutual care and aid. And we can, we can really do that. But as these ideas take deeper hold, and I think that they constantly are with every day that we see the failures of our political and economic system, what I think you're going to see is the rising violence against these kinds of movements. And in fact, we're already seeing it, right? As people demand racial justice, immediately you start to see the criminalization of these movements. And you start to see people going to prison. And you start to see, I mean, now how many people have been, how many peaceful protesters have been run over, right, by people? Like that's now like a kind of a more, you know, routine form of dealing with protesters is that you have people that don't like the protesters running them down and not getting prosecuted. And like maybe, you know, as these kind of more militarized elements of society rise up, maybe people are afraid to go protest, right? Maybe they're afraid to get the, the key thrown away and they get thrown in jail for civil disobedience. Maybe people like, maybe there'll be some kind of moment of in the United States, like the Tiananmen Square situation, right? Which was on the one hand, like people standing up to violence, but on the other hand, ultimately it's an authoritarian state basically saying, no, there's not gonna be democracy. You know, and it, what, you know, so what we really face is profound crisis of legitimacy and it's generational too. It's very generational now uh, in ways that it hasn't been, particularly in the, in the global North, where people don't feel like they have much of a future and they don't have a stake in the system. And so what do they do with that energy? And if they start to organize it and direct it, my guess, and it's already happening, is that they will be framed as criminals. And so that will legitimate or justify violence against people and that can shut down political space. So are we going to be are we going to be radical? We're increasingly radicalizing in the United States. Are we going to go into radical pessimism when these movements get crushed? Or are those are, are violence against movements going to incite more activism and a larger show of force in civil society and support for kind of a democracy that just doesn't fit into the, the rules and the political system that we have? So that's, I do see, I do see another question, was it hard for me to make my name for myself in this field? I have not made a name for myself in my field. Um, exactly. It was incredibly hard. It was incredibly, it was the hardest thing I've ever done was to become an anthropologist, for sure. And it's incredibly difficult. And it, it probably against some good advice of a lot of people, you know, like, why are you doing this? Like, but it took a lot of failure and a lot of persistence um, in order to, to be able to keep doing it and to but I was driven by the sense that I could make a difference. I could do something positive. And hopefully I'm starting, I feel like I'm just now starting to do that. So anyway, I don't know if that's very encouraging, but. You know, I, I just want to uh, share my screen really quickly and, and point everyone to 
um, your book, which is actually available on open access uh, at, through Cornell University. So if you go to, um, I can share the link actually in the chat um, and I'll do that now, but you can actually access uh, your book, the, the Democracy Development Machine. You can download the PDF for free. And so I encourage everyone to uh, take a look at this and um, you know, you can, you can uh, probably direct your questions. I'm sure your email is easy to find. If you have any further questions for uh, Dr. Copeland, you can direct them to him. But let's just all give you a really uh, large thanks for your time. You've been very generous. Um, I know it's not easy to just kind of zoom, 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 zoom all day. Uh, but we really appreciate uh, you engaging with us today. I want to also thank everyone who asked a question and everyone who made it uh, to this event today. And uh, let's just give uh, Dr. Copeland a nice round of applause. Thank you. Thank you all very much for coming and listening and for engaging and for asking the questions that you did ask. And I'm around, right? I'm in Virginia. I'm not too far away. Well, right now I'm in Arkansas, but virtually in Virginia. So love to talk about these topics um, always and really appreciate it. And I'm very thankful uh, to Rohan for the invitation. And thank you so much for this opportunity. And I look forward to talking in the future. About this hopefully, series. hopefully next time in the future, you'll be here in person. We'll do like that a nice. person lecture. Hold that would be great. That would be really great. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good thank day. Thank you. And I'll put the link in the chat for everyone. Yeah, it's really cool that your book is available. You know, I mean, I feel like it, it was through a special program with, it was a collaboration with Virginia Tech, correct? Right, it was. It was uh, uh, through a tome project. I think it's towards an open monograph environment. And I was able to benefit from a grant through Virginia Tech and the libraries because um, it costs a lot of money to produce an academic book. And I think it was about $15,000. And I benefited from the fact that the program was just getting started at Virginia Tech at the time. And, you know, not a lot of people were, you know, were trying to get their books done that way. And so I had a book that was, you know, right there. I had a contract with one of the participating presses. And so it's been great, I, you know, to be able to share the book with, you know, with, with people in Guatemala who don't, you know, barely can get academic books, you know, as easily. And academics in Guatemala, you know, they speak English and read English. So they, you know, or they're kind of forced to do it in many ways, but um, they also do it very well. And so the goal now would be to get a lot of it translated into Spanish, which is also quite expensive. It'd be probably about $7,000 to do that. So. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's really nice to be able to share it. Hmm? It shouldn't be too difficult to find someone who can translate it though, right? I mean, you could probably- Oh, finding a translator is great. It's easy. I've got people, but uh, it's the $7,000 that is harder to find. <laughs> Although just yesterday, uh, the Guatemalan, I don't forget who it was. I think it was the Guatemalan police found $122 million that was in some house. Oh, is so, that where I left it? <laughs> yeah, that is right. You should just, if you could describe it, like <laughs> what it was in and stuff like that, I think they'll, they'll return it to you. Uh, was it a poke that bag? <laughs> I don't know. They haven't revealed exactly, but they're going to, no, of course the debate is like, who's payoff money, what narco money, what corruption money was this, you know, and whose was it and how did it get there? And so this has been, you know, I spend a lot of time on Guatemala Twitter. It's an, there's a lot of interesting ways to do field work now online. Uh, Right. Yeah. A lot of civil society in Guatemala is, of course, now on Zoom. And so a lot of the work we've been doing with water rights organizing is, you know, hey, Zoom meeting, uh, which is in some ways access, like, you know, anthropological access, ethnographic access, like I've never had before. But it's, of course, you know, limited and stilted, as we all know, the ups and downs of Zoom. So... Yeah. But yeah, somebody, there's a, there's a recording of this lecture, Omer um, asked this question to everyone. And so there will be a, a recording. Where can we put this? Where, what do you guys think? Where can we put this lecture so that it can be accessible? Mark, do you have any? Yeah, we might be able to put it up on our website. I mean, like I can get, um, ask um, person over in the Dean's office to, to load it up on our website, which would be great. Cool. Give it a lot, you know, maximum, maximum. We can send it out to all of our majors too uh, in yeah. the school. Totally. Yeah. Do we have time for me to follow up with a question? Yeah, sure. sure, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, really, I just so appreciated so many different aspects of your talk. It was really amazing. And the work you're Thank doing you. is so important. I, a couple of us privately were saying, 
This is exactly the kind of work that we need to be doing more of and getting our students more involved in um, as a school. So, I mean, you're, you're, the particularities of your talk were wonderful, uh, but I think also as a model of the kind of work that is the most important work for us to all be doing right now. So I really appreciate that. Wow, thank you so much. It really means a lot to me. Um, and I, you know, I try to put things together and then now I feel overwhelmed by it. And it's like, well, my, now I'm doing a lot of the work on the ground, but I'm not writing as much. Uh, <laughs> this right, is weird. Yeah. Yeah, it's a struggle. Um, yeah. yeah. Now that I have tenure, I'm like, well, maybe what I should be doing is just, you know, I, I do write a lot more public pieces and I do a lot more work in translation mm -hmm. and I'm writing things that are kind of more internal documents among people. And I feel like, well, that's more meaningful right now. And if there is a time for academic publication, I think it's going to, they'll, they'll build out of that. But yeah. there's one thing that I wanted to mention too, and this is something that uh, it affects us all as Virginians. Uh, so I'm, for some accident, they allowed me to become the chair of the University Commission on Outreach and International Affairs at Virginia Tech. Hmm. And underneath uh, that commission is Virginia Cooperative Extension, hmm. which operates throughout the Commonwealth and extension agents have long histories and community relationships and also knowledge and organizational capacity. And so the proposal that we're doing this year is to try to make extension uh, respond to the interrelated crises of COVID. Obviously, we're about to enter into a great recession, which I can't believe I, I didn't even mention that in all the things I said today. But we're about to enter into a massive recession. And also, then after that, we're facing very on the barrels of climate change. And they're obviously related to one another. And we also are in a situation where we have, you know, tens of thousands. And these are our students. They're highly motivated. They're idealistic. They're really bright. And they're in debt up to their ears, and they're about to enter into a world of unemployment and underemployment. And so one thing I'm trying to do is, and this is something we need to build a coalition around this, and it needs to be a big thing if it's going to happen, is how can we get, um, the budgets, of course, for extension have been flat for decades, and they don't really have a mandate for doing um, any kind of transformation. But I think that we're at this point where we need to reimagine and expand extension and maybe give it more of a, uh, a mandate to promote uh, a different kind of food system, you know, decentralized, democratic, maybe create a land trust um, in different places. The huge demand for CSAs is not met and they know how to help those and get them set up. We need cooperatives, right? We need um, community support networks. I was thinking about things like collective kitchens and collective childcare. I mean, we're about to face, you know, 40, 50 million. I mean, it hasn't really hit the ground yet, the unemployment situation, the economic realities. And of course, we're state employees that are incredibly fortunate to have our jobs and to be able to work online. But then there's so many people who are just out of work. And it's who knows how many people are going to be coming back. I think. Gosh, in some ways, I think that the economy is just being kept along just to give Trump enough of a chance to kind of win. Yeah. And, you know, what's I mean, going to happen? Wasn't, if it wasn't for the trillions of dollars of stimulus that's going directly to the, mostly all to the corporations, yeah, then it would be really obvious how much this economy is totally tanked at this point in time. I, I mean, it's just the Fed agree. printing money otherwise. Total yeah. Disaster. And with the eviction stuff happening now, or yeah. soon anyway, where people are going to be kicked out of their homes and their apartments, it's going to get much worse, yeah. much, much more quickly. I think. It absolutely is. And I'm, you know, obviously we're all worried about the human impact of this is going to destroy communities, it's going to increase all these inequalities. It's going to, you know, it, it robs people of the mid future. COVID has kind of taken away the present. Uh, the recession takes away the mid, mid future and then climate change. And I think that there's a moment to, you know, hopefully there are going to be federal programs that kind of come along, but I think we need to reimagine like, you know, civilian conservation, programs that, you know, that involve environmental restoration, weatherization, um, building a green grid for renewable energy and wind power, and creating a food system that isn't based on growth. It's not based on entrepreneurialism. It's based on, hey, how can we just meet people's needs in a really immediate way? Because that's the kind of, that's the sustainable economy. So we're at this moment. And so I'm going to be you know, I'm a loud person and I have an idea, but there are a lot of institutional structures. If you can imagine the Ag School of Virginia Tech, they've been described as like the khaki pants brigade. You know, it's fairly conservative, you know, 
they work a lot with agribusiness. Market orientation is kind of part of the DNA of these organizations, you know, and that, that makes sense. And they don't really think of themselves as having a mandate for doing something above and beyond. They work with 4-H programs, mm -hmm. but I think there's a big potential there. And I'm going to try to, you know, our university president is on board. I've met with the leaders of the Co Virginia Cooperative Extension. There's also other economic development elements of the university too that I think could be put in this direction. And hopefully these would kind of have a resonance with what should hopefully, hopefully, hopefully be massive federal spending for the same kind of transition coming along. I mean, I don't, I mean, I think that we're about to hear a lot of concern about the deficit that we haven't heard for, you know, the last four years at all. And we squandered, like the first stimulus was completely squandered and on purpose, perhaps, you know, um, and the fact we're not going to get another one, right? It, doesn't look like it right now. It does not look like we're going to get something else. So this is something that I just want to alert, you know, people who think about these things, people who work with students. I mean, our students are, we're yeah. really working with people that are facing these realities. And we see like kind of now through Zoom, if anything could be more immediate about the crisis that we're in, you know, they're, they're going to school because they don't want to go to school like this, but what else are they doing? You know, they're, they're kind of trapped. And I think kind of related to this, I, I uh, sent a question after we were kind of closing mm -hmm. to Rohan and was speaking very much to, um, I was really curious about the indigenous consultations. I think that was the word you used, yeah. like mm -hmm. that. And whether that might, there's some way that that might provide kind of a model, an alternative model to so-called capitalist democracy, you know, as a way of organizing people. And maybe it applies then to creating the kind of structures that you're talking about here in Virginia and elsewhere that, you know, we could, we could use that idea of grassroots organization yeah, no, I think that is absolutely on point. Um, I had proposed that, you know, there's a really interesting thing happening over, you know, in near Blacksburg, which is the, uh, the Mountain Valley Pipeline fight and the tree sitters that are there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And one really interesting thing is that you have a lot of communities, and of course, notoriously that favor the coal industry, but they're not pro fracking and they're not pro pipeline. They do not want the pipeline through their territories. And so I, you know, my experience, when I was like, maybe some kind of consultation. But I think we need to expand that idea and like, how can we get a consultation about healthcare? Mm -hmm. You know, if not necessarily to like, oh, that's not how you pass a law, but maybe as a way to really demonstrate the popular will for some kind of real alternative and to use it as a cudgel to make the political system respond. You know, and I'll say like the way that the ILO has the International Labor Organizations thought about consultation is limited, right? They basically think that consultation is not the same as a veto and that you get consulted and then they do the project. And that is, you know, that's a limitation of the model, but communities don't see it that way. And they've really reclaimed the idea of consultation to do their own model. And they do see it more as a, more as a veto and more as an exercise of sovereignty than is allowed. But I think we're in a space right now where we really need, I mean, it could be like a plebiscite, you know, these consultations. And like, we have the digital technology, we have the communication technology, we can generate this kind of yeah. public sphere and debate or, you know, consensus around some key issues and particularly regarding climate change and, you know, social programs and the great recession and eviction fees. These are so overwhelmingly supported. Yeah. You know, I mean, I had, I had my students, I'm teaching a class called um, Globalization, Religion, and Social Justice. Mm. And I had my students put together um, kind of policy statements, like, you know, five policies they'd like to see implemented. And it was actually really quite striking for a variety of reasons. One is just that there was great uh, correspondence between these four groups that each mm -hmm. put together the policies. And none of them line up with anything being offered by any of our candidates, right? Running for any offices anywhere, right? So here they are. And they actually speak to and reflect what the majority of citizens in the United States support and probably support almost everywhere. So then the question becomes, all right, well, that's where everybody's you know, standing right now. How do we actually organize to force it to come to fruition? And that's yeah. the kind of million, million dollar question or whatever else. And it does seem like forming these kinds of organizations that can act as cudgels mm -hmm. to compel. No, I like that. I mean, there's like an opinion polls, one thing, but it's limited because what exactly do you mean? You support healthcare, but if you start to 
divide it up in different ways, but like a consultation is, can be kind of a more deliberative process where people yeah. come to, you know, obviously our legislative system doesn't work and it's so dominated by private interest that it can't work, right? Yeah, right. It's designed right. to fail. Yeah. And it's, it represents different constituencies. And, but I think that once you start getting people talking about the actual policies that they want, if you call it Obamacare, they didn't support it. Remember those polls that we saw? Oh, yeah. You call it Obamacare, they didn't support it. But when you asked about all the different elements of the Affordable Care Act, they were overwhelmingly popular. Yeah. You know, and that was limited too. But if you call it socialism, it's bad. But if you have people like get into the brass tacks of what it is, then, you know. Majority support. Like it. Yeah. yeah. But we need to be creative. We definitely need to be creative about how to engage people, how to build organizations, and to do so in a society where we're so hyper individualized on, you know, social media was a space for collective democracy and it was instrumental for the Arab Spring and for Occupy. That space has been governmentalized, right? The hyper differentiation, the finding the wedges, so many different wedges, and there's no real political discourse anymore. It's completely fragmented across, you know, who you are and your demographic. And it's devastating for democracy. And of course, what's happening in the United States is happening with Facebook all over the world. They're subverting, you know, they're doing all sorts of horrible things in support of usually very conservative movements. Mm -hmm. I just saw uh, that recently that like 10% of political Twitter commenters generate 90% or something like that of the wow. political yeah. discourse. So like just wow. a small percentage just dominates the discussion on mm -hmm. social media. So it's not as horizontal as we think. No, and it could be. I mean, there are ways to maybe create different kinds of platforms that are more targeted perhaps to particular issues. It could be, you know, more viable spaces for, you know, I don't know, dialogue, citizenship, these kind of things that I don't think a lot of us really believe in anymore as pessimists. Maybe we're a little bit more radical pessimists along yeah. those lines. Yeah.